Hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Stefano Tassaro from University of Washington as our first speaker. So Stefano Tassaro is an associate professor in Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington, where he holds the Paul G. Allen Development Chair. He works primarily on cryptography, computer security, and theoretical computer science. Earlier, he was an assistant professor at a, uh, UC Santa Barbara, where he held the Glenn and Suzanne Cooler Chair, he received a PhD from ETH Zurich in 2010, um, and held postdoctoral appointments at UC San Diego and MIT. He received several uh, awards for his work, including a Sloan Research Fellowship, an NSF Career Award, and a Hellman Fellowship, as well as a Best Paper Award at Eurocrypt 2017. So over to you, Stefano. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Divesh, for the introduction. And I mean, thanks to the organizer for inviting me. I'm definitely feeling some pressure in opening up the event uh, with this uh, first talk. So but I, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and tell you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing over the last uh, couple of years and also its broader context. So I, in particular, uh, the title is very general. Um, it clearly, it has something to do with cryptography, but I am not assuming any uh, prior knowledge in cryptography, at least for the first half or so, two thirds of the talk, and then maybe the last third will become a little bit more technical, and for those of you who are working in the field might have their appetite somewhat satisfied from that. And if there are any questions, like feel free, it's a big room, but just feel free to uh, raise your hand or just uh, shout out your question, and I'm happy to stop. We have some flexibility uh, in time. So uh, I want to start with maybe one philosophical remark, which is not technical, which is kind of can help us situate this type of work, especially if you're not working on cryptography. Um, so there are really two types of um, ways in which, there are two ways in which cryptographers can, can have impact in their work. And I think it's one of the beauties of uh, our field is that we can have results that are theoretical in nature where the contribution is theoretically valuable, so it gives techniques, mostly focuses on feasibility or new ideas, new tricks. And then on the other hand of the spectrum, we have um, also impact in the real world, so we can come up with solutions that can solve actual security problems for up to billions of users, and uh, cryptography has been enormously successful in doing that. And then there are some rare circumstances where the two things come together, and, and I like to find those, so I find uh, then of uh, problems that are at the interface between theoretical cryptography and real world cryptography where there is some neat theory but also there's potential for, for impact. And today's talk is, is going to be no exception, so I, I'm going to highlight what I consider to be an exciting use case of cryptography in the real world which is gaining momentum in industry and which has some underlying neat theory motivated by the type of challenges that are encountered in the real world. And, I'm going to try to cover some ideas for, from a number of papers I co-authored over the last uh, uh, couple of years with uh, several collaborators, including two of my own students, uh, Champ Chayatana Piram and Chen Ji Zhu. And, and then, actually, if you are in crypto, you might know some of the names. An interesting thing, which usually doesn't happen with my work, is that a number of these collaborators are in industry, which is kind of a strong indication of the interest uh, from the applied world on this type of work. Okay. So what is this, got, this is about? So, so the starting point for this work is, is really something many of us are certainly familiar with, and is the fact that as we go about our days, we use a number of applications, either on the web or through apps, that end up collecting either explicitly or implicitly so large amounts of information about us. And usually, uh, this is done for a just completely legitimate reasons, so maybe because uh, this collection enables the functionality, that we want to have in these applications, or maybe because it provides better user experience, or maybe because it enables financial support through ads for this application that will not otherwise exist. But the bottom line is that there are so many channels uh, that can be used to collect information about users that it's very hard to have an overview of what is being collected, and this creates a lot of concern and erodes trust among users in applications. And so today I want to talk about some very pragmatic interventions using cryptography that can make um, users more anonymous while using applications so without changing the underlying functionality. And I want to be clear that this is an enormous topic. Like a lot of the ongoing research in cryptography, even rather theoretical ones, all the way to applied crypto can be cast as contributing to this general direction. 
So today I want to be very pragmatic and look at things that are being really considered in industry for solutions at scale. So I'm really thinking about things that can be used in every single internet browser that can be used by billions of users. So they need to be very, very simple. And then I, I want to explain what these are. In fact, they're not, some of you might have heard about this, but they're not very well documented, and that's going to be the overview part of this talk. And then I'll try to motivate some theoretical questions out of that, that uh, if solved, can actually lead to better practical uh, solutions. And in fact, these, these questions, they are all related to very old cryptographic concepts, objects like blind signatures and anonymous credentials that I will introduce, that have actually been studied for decades at this point. But the interesting thing is that they, they, they hadn't found much application in, 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 uh, in applied context in industry, so some other time was not right. And only recently, due to, amount, to increasing tr pressure, both from a regulatory standpoint and also from, from user perception, wanting more privacy, so it, industry was pressured to adopt solutions and realized that some of these tools were the right thing to use. Uh, to improve the situation, and this has in turn motivated new questions for us as cryptographers to provide uh, better solutions that we were not considering before. All right, so this is the broader context. Um, I, I want to tell you first a little bit about the, the kind of problems we are going to look at a little bit more specifically. And, and one thing I want to make clear here is that even though maybe we, we would like to give you the promise from crypto of give you fully anonymous web browsing so you can surf the web and leave as little information behind as possible. I mean, the, the, the starting point here is that this is very hard to do. The reason this is very hard to do is because when you design applications, there's all sort of features that you want to have that provide channels for potential collection of information, either explicitly or implicitly. So you want to have things like access control. You want to decide whether a user can use a particular application or not. And uh, you will want to process user inputs that might contain some uh, information from the users. Uh, you want, want to keep state um, throughout uh, the user journey um, that, that can allow some tracking. Um, there are other things like fraud prevention mechanism, analytics, and again, incorporating ads. So all of these things uh, create potential for collection of information. And if you want to design, design applications in a cautious way that limits this collection, or limit at least the risk that information might be collected, that's actually very hard at the technical level. And then for example, think about something very simple that we use every day, like you want to um, use some newspaper website that wants to only give access to articles to legitimate subscribers. And so the way this is usually implemented is that you will have some login process where the users are asked to in input their credentials and then they, they will be verified and as belonging to a legitimate subscriber and then the user journey can continue and the user can actually read articles uh, on, on the newspaper and maybe learn that some other articles are not meant to be read because they don't have the right type of subscription. They're not paying enough for a premium subscription or something like that. And then if you want to implement something like this, um, you need to already uh, introduce uh, some, some means to, typically they're implemented using uh, browser cookies that allow um, the, some, some state to be maintained across uh, multiple accesses uh, to the website that um, basically bind the user to a particular notion of a session. And, and this already, whether the, the website wants to take advantage of that or not, it enables the potential for tracking the users uh, through their user journey on, on the website. So they can, accesses can be linked together as belonging to the same user, and this user is typically the anonymized because they, uh, they will insert their credentials and they pay for a subscription. And so that's already something um, that one might ask whether it's necessary, whether we can do better uh, when uh, creating such a service. And then things can get much more complex. This is really about tracking uh, on a single website. But if you look, for example, at ad, uh, ads ecosystem, at advertisements, things can get much more complex and, and tracking can also happen across websites. Right? So without even thinking about what happens in order to even decide whether a particular ad is displayed or not. Like for example, if you have a particular ad which is displayed on say your favorite social network and you decide to click on it, then normally what happen, you will be redirected to some other website, say an online shop, and then you decide later to purchase the item for which you have seen the ad. But it's very valuable from a business perspective to 
uh, be able to now record the event that the ad has indeed led the user to buy a particular product. That's what we call an ad conversion. And you want to register this event and record it and then signal to the source of the ad, for example, or to whoever else needs to be involved that this ad conversion has happened. And in particular, in this case, the online shop needs to know that the user was on a particular website when they clicked the ad, say the social network, as opposed to any of the other, web of the other websites that were displaying uh, ads from the same campaign. Right? So this involves, again, sharing some information that you have been on a particular website before uh, landing uh, into this online shop. Right? And again, this has been historically implemented using variants of cookies that are known as third-party cookies until uh, you know, some time back. And um, the problem with this is that um, you know, when you think about being tracked uh, in, in, in browsing, uh, usually that's in conjunction with third-party cookies. And there's been an enormous push from the browser industry to make this type of cross-site tracking harder and harder. And so if you, if you uh, follow like, recent developments in, in the browser space, there's been uh, more and more push for disabling this type of third-party cookies by default so that uh, tracking will not happen by default. And of course, this has created a little bit of a crisis in the, in the ad industry because um, ad conversion measurements are very important. They bring revenue, and um, they cannot really be done without such cross-site tracking. And so companies started asking questions about whether this can be done in some way which is more privacy-preserving and doesn't reveal as much information about the browsing history of users as they click through ads and go to different websites. And so I want to tell you a little bit what is being considered, because this will serve as a good introduction for the crypto we are going to um, discuss next. And again, these are very simple, uh, minimal solutions that are very lightweight and, and can improve the, the situation. And what I'm going to present here is still in the context of ads, because it's simpler to explain. But I hope you realize that these tools are more generic and can be used maybe in less controversial context uh, to, to improve privacy. And what I'm going to explain here is actually uh, the object of a number of proposals. I mean, pretty much every major tech company has a proposal um, around this problem. And they're all very similar. They, 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 they share very similar ideas. And the World Wide Web Consortium is also, has established a working group that is considering standardization of, of these ideas. And so what, what are we trying to do here? Right? So we would like to, again, measure such ad conversions. But we would like to do this in a, in a more private way. And one first idea is that we sort of try to minimize the amount of information which is revealed to the individual touch points through the user journey and instead do a lot of things locally within the browser first. So what I mean by that is that when, for example, the user on its first touch point clicks on an ad, what is going to happen within the browser locally is that the browser is going to initiate uh, what we call a conversion report. Uh, which is associated to some unique random identifier. Uh, this is meant to be unique for each report. And then the browser will locally record the, the relevant event. So the fact that there was a click on a particular uh, uh, website and that that click was on an ad uh, was on social.com and will lead the user to shop.com. Then if the user actually uh, goes to that website and then purchase the items, then later that will trigger a next, another event, so the fact that the, the item was purchased will be added to this uh, conversion report. And so, so far, this is just regular web browsing. Of course, the user might be authenticated to these two services, so the individual services know what the user is, but no information is being shared with them that links the fact that the user has been on one website and then to the other one. Everything has happened locally. And then later on, what at some a predetermined time, for example, you know, once every day, once every week, the browser will just send anonymously um, all of the generated conversion reports to the, relevant, um, uh, to the relevant entities. And this will allow them to measure uh, the, the ad conversion. And what I mean here by sending anonymously is very context dependent. So one could think about simply sending this in a non-authenticated way to these websites and just trust that that's enough, or you could use some services like Tor to um, anonymize this. It doesn't really matter. I'll, I'll keep this general. So the, or the question here is, this, is this a good approach, right? And this is a fundamental problem here that you might see with this approach, which is that if all you're asking is you trust the browser to create faithfully these reports, and then uh, these reports being correct and measuring actual events, that's, of course, a very weak uh, mechanism in terms of integrity 
because really nothing prevents a malicious actor from creating conversion reports that record events that actually haven't happened. And since there is usually revenue associated with these conversions, uh, there's really a lot of potential for fraud here in just creating uh, fictitious reports that contain events that are not, not real. And so instead, what we want to do here is we want to have the level of integrity to make sure that only events are recorded that have really happened, and there are some mechanisms for the individual touch points to verify that the, report, that the event is happening, give authorization to add it to this report. And to do this, like, a simple solution is to just use digital signatures to start with, which many of you must have encountered. And so what are digital signatures? This is one of the most basic um, cryptographic tools to achieve integrity. And the idea is that we have um, um, a method to generate, uh, for a signer to generate a pair of keys, a secret signing key, and a public verification key. And then the signer, with help of the signing key, can create a signature for any message they like. So typically this is done by running an, an efficient algorithm that takes as input a signing key and the message to be signed. And then the output is a signature, sigma, I'll often use this notation, sigma sk of a message, to denote the signature uh, for a message uh, under that key. And then this, this signature can be verified by anyone with the public verification key. Right? So the idea is that you can only generate signatures with the secret signing key, but anyone can verify validity of a signature with the public uh, verification key. So what we want to have here in terms of security is what we call unforgeability. So with the verification key alone, you shouldn't be able to come up with a valid signature for a message that hasn't been signed before by uh, the legitimate signer. So signatures are really you know, the, the, the first step now to add integrity to the solution I just proposed. And what I mean by that is that now every time an event happens, so first of all, now all of the touch points will have individual key pairs for signatures. So the, the social network will have their own keys. The shop will have their own keys. And now when an, a report is added to a conversion, so when, when an event is added to a conversion report, what needs to happen, there needs to be some signature coming from that particular touch point that attests that that event has really happened. So there will be some mechanism that might vary from the website to check that the click was really legitimate, that it was done by a human and not by, by a robot or anything like that. And then when that's kind of certified, the signature is going to be issued and then it can be added to the report. And the same will happen afterwards when the purchase happens. Now we have these sort of certified events added to the report and then Again, the report can be sent anonymously. So now we solve one problem, where we made things works worse on the other side, on the other end, because we now have integrity. Um, so obviously, when this report is submitted, you will verify that the signatures are valid, and that should ensure you that these are real events. So integrity is good. You cannot create a fake report if these events were not confirmed by the relevant touch points. But we actually lost entirely privacy. We have no anonymity anymore. Why is that the case? Now, every report is associated to some unique report identifier. And as the user um, goes through their journey and they collect these signatures, they will reveal this report identifier to the services to get the corresponding signature. So now the services could come together and just link these signatures to usernames that were um, the user when using when they obtained these signatures. Right? So hopefully this, this makes sense, why, why this is not a good idea. But this leads us to the final step, um, which is the, the, the next question is, can we actually make this idea work? And that can we actually find ways for the different touch points to generate such signatures? So hence, uh, proceed as I just described. But the generation of these signatures is private in the sense that although the, the browser, the user, obtains a valid signature, um, the, the, the touch point while generating the signature will not learn what is being signed and what the resulting signature is. So this kind of magical way of signing is what we call a blind signature. And it's something that actually has been introduced already back in the 80s. Um, and it was used initially for um, this first approaches to digital cash, which had nothing to do with contemporary blockchains, but people were thinking about digital forms of cash back then, and blight signatures played a crucial role. And this was a notion introduced by David Chaum, who back then actually made 
really incredibly important seminal contribution in at least proposing notions that have been central to the design of privacy preserving systems uh, up to date. And so the, what, is the, what is the idea here, right? So the idea is that we want to create a signature, but now we think of signing as an interactive process where we have a, sign a signer on the left who knows the signing key, and we have a user on the right who knows the public verification key and has a message they want to have signed by the signer. And the user and the signer now engage in an interactive protocol that can proceed over multiple rounds of communication. And at the end of this interaction, the user is supposed to out, output a valid signature on that message. And now what we require here is that in this process, the signer doesn't learn any information about the message and the signature, the message being signed and the signature which is generated. Right? So even though at the end of this interaction, the user will output a valid signature, the signer has no idea what the signature looks like and what the message is that is being, is being signed. And of course, on the other hand, we want to protect the system from uh, forgery. So we want to make sure that if a user is potentially malicious and deviates from the protocol when interacting with the signer, they cannot just get arbitrary signatures out of this. So here, the, the notion we achieve is rather subtle, but the general idea is that we want to ensure that if a user maliciously engages in a number of signing sessions with the signer, then they cannot produce more signatures than the number of sessions they've engaged in. So if they complete the protocols three times with the signer, they can only produce three valid signatures. So getting a signature costs the effort of interacting with the signer. And now you might realize that's exactly what we need to, fi to finish our, our, um, uh, our approach. So instead of issuing signatures through regular signing, now every time an event happens and we want to add a corresponding entry in the uh, conversion report, what we do is we obtain the signature through blind signing. So the, the touch points can still verify that this event has legitimately happened, but when they then decide to engage in the signing process, they will use a blind signature to create a signature they have no information about how it looks like, nor they learn anything about the report ID. And so now when you later send in this, uh, this conversion report at some later point in time, even if all of the touch points come together and they try to learn information, all they will see is that they attested that these events have indeed happened, but they cannot link them back to the, user, the, the users that were involved when these events happened. Okay, hopefully this makes sense, but if you have any question, feel free to ask them here, or things that concern you, or, yeah? So they, they do have a timestamp that at some point they generated a signature, say you're authenticated with your username and they, will, they can potentially remember that you know, at, 12, at 10.23 uh, they generated uh, um, a signature for this particular user. But when they see the actual signature, they cannot link the signature together to that particular timestamp. So the signature will not be known to them. They will just know that this is, say that, obviously this doesn't make much sense if the service only has one user because then it's very easy to frame you as the one person who has received the signature. But if there were a million of users that have received signatures in that particular time frame, all they will learn is that that's one of the signatures they issued, um, but they cannot link it to the particular timestamp. Uh, that's a very good question. Yeah. Absolutely. Excellent question. By the way, excellent questions are always those that have an answer on the next slide. So, okay. <laughs> so, so, but I'm not giving a full answer. So I want to point out that, yes, so, um, so it's, it's half truth. So uh, in order for this to work, you actually need to add metadata, and that's a real problem, right? Because just adding a signature is usually not enough of information. You typically want to say, which ad campaign was this related to, where the link was heading to. And so typically, we will use something which is stronger than a regular blind signature. It's something that we call a partially blind signature that allows you to have some secret part of the message and some public part of the message. And now you're going to correctly point out that what kind of metadata we include there is extremely relevant. And I am not trying to argue here. You know, Thankfully, it's easy when it's not your work. 
that uh, everything being done is a good idea. So this requires a lot of analysis, how it's being proposed. So typically these proposals, we try to restrict the amount of metadata to give it like some level of granularity that makes linking hard, that they limit the number of ad campaigns that can be included and all sorts of things because of course you could potentially just you know, create personal, personalized ad campaigns that are specifically tailored at you, right? That's why I think there's still a lot of analysis needed here for the actual system orthogonally to the crypto. And I'm not saying that you know, everything will look good there, um, but that's an excellent point, yeah. All right. Good, so um, I want to say that these tools can also be used in other contexts that are, that are simpler. Um, if we go back to our user authentication um, um, examples from, from the online newspaper, um, so there are two, right? So we could use similar ideas, in fact, a little bit simpler, um, to anonymize the user journey. Because again, what, what typically happens in a non-cryptographic case is that you will log in authenticate yourself, and if this login is successful, there will be some you know, local cookie stored in your browser that will store some, if you do this right, in a way that resists obvious um, sort of uh, replay attacks or and of that, attacks of that sort, so what will happen is that you will get some sort of token stored locally, which you can also think of as a signature on some session identifier that is generated for this unique user. And then uh, as the user goes through their journey and browses through different articles, they will send off that to this token to the, to, the, to the newspaper that can then verify it is valid and that attests that the user has authenticated themselves. And then obviously here what happens is that you can just track these tokens as it's reused and you will know that that's the particular user had, that had initially logged in and that you will know who that person is and which articles they're browsing through. And so here again, what you could do, right, is the first thing you could try to do is to actually um, use blind signing to generate that token. So now what happens is there's a secret session identifier generated by the user as they log in. And if the login is successful, the server will engage in a blind signing protocol that will produce a signature blindly. And they won't know anything about either of the actual session ID and the corresponding signature. And then every time you actually retrieve an article, you will now share that anonymous token and that is now the decoupled from the actual user that authenticated because there's no way to link it back. Uh, this is still not maybe the, the, the highest level of anonymity you might want to have because it's still possible to observe that you're using the same token. You don't know which user this token belongs to, but you will know that it's the same user accessing this particular article and the other one. And maybe you can get some idea that, um, you know, just in my example, if there's one person from Singapore was reading articles about the Washington Huskies football team losing the final the other day. You might not know even what I'm talking about because I'm probably the only person in Singapore who will care, right? So you can still like, you know, kind of get some idea there, but you can do better, right? So you can, for example, I know it's more expensive, like you could try to add an extra layer of anonymity uh, by creating multiple tokens instead of creating one token, right? So you create multiple session identifiers with corresponding tokens, which are individual blind signatures. Of course, that's more expensive. And then every single article you access, you will consume one of these tokens. And that will add an extra level of granularity. And now the, the, the server will just see different valid tokens, but cannot, in general, know directly whether they belong to the same user or whether they come from different users because they will look exactly the same. And so this idea is something that has, has been used now for a while. So I think it was used first explicitly in production in a system called Privacy Pass that some of you have might have heard about. It was originally developed at Cloudflare, but now it's actually more widely adopted in industry. And the, the original context was mostly in the context of captures. So you want to authenticate yourself as a human and then um, you don't want to do this over and over. So once you're authenticated, you will get some tokens that you can consume to prove you're human without uh, resolving an annoying capture again. But it can be used more generally in such contexts. And one interesting thing about Privacy Pass is that it doesn't actually need a, a blind signature because in this context, the, per the entity that verifies your token is the entity that issues them. So you can actually use a weaker object, which is called a verifiable oblivious pseudo random function, which has many more applications, but one way to think about it is as a secret key version of a blind signature. Um, it turns out that it's not less obvious how to add metadata here. We've done some work there. And at the end of the day, it turns out that 
Privacy Pass still uses blind signatures for engineering reasons, but it's interesting to note that something weaker will, 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 will be enough. And then several industry products have kind of expanded on this idea and, and of anonymous tokens and did different things with them. Um, so another thing I wanted to point out, though I will not talk too much about it, but is that uh, one problem with these tokens, I um, actually had a line on this here, is that clearly they are one-time use as I explained them. So if you want to generate K tokens to read K different articles anonymously, you have to spend K times more resources in generating them. And also they have some limited expressivity, so they, they can only kind of attest to one bit of signal. You have the token, you don't have the token, maybe there's some metadata. But you might, in many cases, do more. And in principle, this is something we can also do. So there, there, you can think of, um, there's, there's another related primitive, which you can think of as a generalization of what we've just seen, which is referred to as an anonymous credential. And anonymous credentials basically allow us to, to add more to this process I just explained by kind of uh, spending you know, less in terms of computational resources. So the idea here is that during the authentication process, you can actually create a, a digital credential uh, when interacting with the server after successful login that is tied to a number of attributes. So this is just one credential, one short string, you know, a, a few dozen bytes, and it's tied to a number of attributes that the, the service will verify as being correct about you. Like there will be your username, you'll be your age, by the way, that's not my real age. Uh, there should be you know, your location, the type of subscription you have, when it expires, and so on. And some of these attributes might be public, they are verified as being valid, you can also add some secret attributes to it. And you get this credential which is issued and can be verified as being a valid credential issued by the service, and it's tied to all of these attributes. And once you have that, you can actually use it through different accesses in a much more expressive way. So for example, you might access one article and you can share a short proof generated from that credential that tells you that you indeed have a valid credential that attests that you're a valid subscriber. And this proof will leak only that. So it's a zero knowledge proof that doesn't leak more than that. And then later on, you might actually access another article and you can append another proof that attests that you have a credential that also uh, um, uh, gives you, a, that, that certifies that you have a valid, like a premium subscription, for example. And so and the interesting thing is that all of these proofs cannot be linked together, although they come from the same credential. They are unlinkable. So even if you reprove the same statement multiple times, you cannot say that it's the same credential generated them. And so they potentially allow for a lot of potential functionality in uh, interacting anonymously with the service. The reason I'm not going to talk too much about them today is that there is a lot of interest. Um, there is standardization process, but from the theoretical standpoint, they're somewhat maybe less interesting. So basically what, what happens is that these anonymous credentials are built by generically composing uh, the right signature scheme with zero knowledge proofs, and the game is to find a good signature schemes that allow you to do this efficiently. And we basically have converged on a scheme called BBS that exists already since 2004. Ironically, there's been a number of follow-up works until recently, and including ours, in trying to optimize it and make it as efficient as possible. But basically now it's just an issue of standardizing this, and there are working groups around this, and then finding applications. And we are seeing more and more applications. They are, it's this, this a credential are less efficient than blind signatures. So we have maybe fewer like natural applications in the web context, but there's, there are efforts around decentralized identity in the blockchain space that go hand in hand with anonymous credentials. And we're also seeing a lot of interest from governments in using them as replacement for actual on paper credentials when using online services. They are the ideal solutions. So things are also growing in this space as we speak. So we're seeing more and more. Okay. So what I want to do next is I want to maybe talk a little bit more about cryptography, starting from sort of the high level and then get maybe deeper down, and maybe we'll have a break um, at some point halfway uh, through this. And I, I hope that I convinced you that uh, these tools, and in particular blind signatures, have applications and are being considered for uh, these important problems. Um, but what I want to convince you now is that actually building good blind signatures that are suitable uh, for these um, systems and are truly practical and are what engineers would like to use turns out to be a, a very interesting um, technical challenge. And I actually don't think we have a good answer yet uh, for all of these systems. And I'll try to explain you why. 
And, and to do that, I, I, I need to tell you a little bit more about how uh, blind signatures are actually built. And uh, there are really two ways of doing this. So one of them is sort of the textbook approach that a theoretician will take. So if you ask a theoretician in cryptography, they will say that this is a solved problem and it's easy to solve. And that's what I'm going to explain you first. This is a generic approach to build blind signatures based on just any signature scheme. You transform it into a blind signature scheme. And, and it works, but it will have some practicality drawbacks. And then I'll tell you how sort of practice favors more ad hoc designs and what the challenges there are. And so again, what I want to show you first is how you can take any signature scheme and your favorite one, cryptographers have proposed uh, really tons of them, and you can transform it using a tool called a zero knowledge proof into a blind signature scheme generically. So I'm going to give you really a literal recipe that step by step transforms a signature scheme into a blind one. So how does it work? So the first step is, is, is the easiest one. It's just like a change of perspective. And it's the fact that uh, we need to start from a signature scheme, which is meant to be used by a signer to produce a signature locally. They have a key. They generate a signature. And now I want to think of this instead as an interactive protocol between a user and a signer. So the user now has the message, and the signer has the key. And now, instead of the signer doing everything, we have a protocol where the user gives the message to the signer, then the signer will sign it, sends the signature back, and now the user can output it. I mean, nothing magical happening here. It's just a change of perspective, and I'm convincing your signature can just do that. Of course, nothing is blind here. The signer learns everything, learns the message, learns the signature. So, but in, in an attempt to make it it's blind, so the first thing we could try to do, that's the second step in this recipe, is we are going to at least hide the message being signed. We see this is not going to be enough, but that's the first step. And there's also an easy way of doing that. So basically what we do is instead of signing the message and sending the message over to the signer, we send something that cryptographers call a commitment uh, to the message. So you can think of this as the easiest way to realize this is that you take some cryptographic hash functions that is meant to take some input and create a short unrelated, intelligible digest of it, and you just hash the message concatenated with some randomness that you generate each time afresh in the signing process. This produces some short hash, which is meant not to give you any information about the underlying message, but you send that to the signer, and the signer will sign the hash instead of signing the message. And the user can now output the signature on the hash, and the randomness they used to hash the message and now you can see that this new longer signature can also be verified once you're given a message because you can rehash it with the randomness and then check that the signature is, is a valid signature on that hash. The hash is a deterministic process, so it just re-gives you the same hash once you're given the randomness. So this is not yet a blind signature because it's only half of a blind signature. In the signing process, we are hiding what is being signed, but uh, the actual signature which is generated at the end is the actual, part of it is the actual sigma that was sent back by the signer. So if the signer later sees this pair sigma rand, they can know which session generated the signature and, and just link it back. So that's not good. It's only hiding the message at signing time. So how do we solve this final step? It's actually a very simple idea once you have the right hammer. Uh, we replace this output with something else, which is a short proof. It's a string which acts as a proof, a zero knowledge proof, that of the statement that we know, certain, we know such a pair sigma rand that was there before. So, so this proof will attest that whoever generated it actually knew a pair consisting of a signature sigma and the randomness, such that sigma is a signature on the hash obtained with the message and the randomness, and it's a valid signature that verifies uh, with the verification key of the signer. Right, that this is magic that, that comes from these zero knowledge proofs. I won't tell you how we build them, but there are fairly off the shelf solutions that we can use for that. And the point is that this proof will really only, it will only be possible to generate it if the statement is really true. And so the, the, the user has really obtained such a signature from the signer. But on the other hand, this proof doesn't reveal anything other than the validity of the statement. So there is no other uh, information that can be gathered from it. So it's completely, um, the, this, you cannot reconstruct 
a malicious sign and I cannot later reconstruct which signature was used to generate the proof. And so this actually gives you a, a, a blind signature. And uh, the point here is that it's, there, there's a little bit of some caveats I will go back to at the end, but uh, in general, this approach is not very practical. Everything is practical up to the generation of the proof pi. We can do it. There are different tools, that different ways to instantiate this. But the cost of generating such proofs is much higher than the cost to generate a regular signature. I mean, by orders of magnitude sometimes. And also, I mean, another problem that affects practitioners is that you usually try to integrate something like this in an existing application, and you would like signatures to look like regular signatures, like the, the one you would normally use, and this looks very different. The signature is a, is a proof. So the question here is whether can we, do, can we do better? So ideally, we would like to have something faster, and we would like to have something that produces signatures that are somewhat looks like the signature that we will use in, in developing these systems. And I want to tell you a little bit more here that about this um, in the rest of the talk, because it turns out to be sort of tricky, somewhat bizarre, and actually interesting, both at the um, engineering level and also the theoretical level. Let me, are there more questions? Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's a good question. So typically, the, the generic way. Yeah, so I, so I can tell you that. So, so most of the, mostly what happens with these solutions, they are off-the-shelf solutions, which requires you to write down a program that verifies this statement. So, so you need to write down a program that takes uh, this, uh, this witness, which will be the signature and the randomness, and then verifies, and the message, and verifies that this is indeed a signature. And typically, you need to compile this program not, uh, you know, you don't write it in C. You model it as a circuit, which makes it even more complicated. And then the efficiency will scale in different ways with the, with the size of the circuit, uh, usually linearly. The, the, the efficiency of generating the proof will scale linearly or n log n when n is the size of the circuit. So this can be very expensive because the representation of the circuit can be very big. Of course, it depends which concrete signature you're using and so on. You can, you can play around with that, but it's orders of magnitude more expensive than generating just a signature as is. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you now a little bit more about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But typically, you should envision something like, um, you know, and, and I'll give you a concrete example, but like, you know, a num an, an integer, you know, mod uh, some a few thousand bits modulus or something like that. That's what you will expect this to be rather than something structured and more complex. Yeah. All right. So, so in fact, I'll, I, and again, this is a bit the drawback of this talk. So we are coming from above. So you will see the, the, the low-level details as we continue. So a lot of these things, a lot of acronyms around without maybe all of you having an idea what these are. But, but, but you know, if we, if we look at which signature scheme exists, so this is not meant to have you understand what these are. But I just want to point out that there are different ways of building signatures uh, in, uh, in practice. And they are built out of very different mathematical structures. And there are really way more signatures, but here I'm writing those I consider the, the standard choices if you were to build a system in the real world. Um, and they're, they're very different flavors, right? And they rely on different mathematical structures that have implications, both about their security, about implementation constraints, uh, and, and all sorts of things. Like, for example, if you, um, RSA is a, uh, RSA signatures are one known way to build signatures that has been used over the years all over the place. That's kind of the legacy approach. Uh, for building signatures, and I'm kind of calling them here uh, brittle and clunky because this is the, the, the kind of things that we, we are trying to move over because RSA signatures, are, their security is very tightly related to the hardness of factoring integers. And factoring integers is a problem that can be solved in sub-exponential times, and there are um, regular, regularly there are improvements in the running times of algorithms for factoring that improve things a little bit. And this usually requires reassessing things like the size of the keys that you're using for RSA. So if you want to use these things over 20 years, then usually it's not great. And also there's all sorts of implementation issues with RSA that create potential vulnerabilities. So generally the world is trying to move away from RSA. And you'll see why I'm making this a point uh, in a slide or two and why it is important. And then we have sort of more modern ways of doing signatures, which are i would spend some time talking about them in the next few slides that are based on structures called elliptic curves. And these are usually the favored way of doing signatures nowadays, especially Schnorr signatures that we'll describe shortly. 
And then again, we have other types of signatures. I mean, I don't know if any, I imagine some of you are familiar with the blockchain ecosystem here in the room, and there are, there's the signature scheme called BLS, which is extremely versatile and gives you everything you might want to have as a signatures, but require somewhat more rigid per elliptic curves that are called pairing-friendly elliptic curves, and they tend to be sort of a bit less understood, generally less efficient. They're not available in the type of cryptographic libraries that a browser will use. So there, there's a bit less flexibility in using them, though they're much more powerful. And then we have the post-quantum world. There are signatures being standardized as we speak that are meant to be secure against quantum attacks and use different types of underlying problems to, to achieve that. So you see, there's a variety of approaches that you might be considering in practice. They rely on different problems. So say you might ask for which, so say these are kind of the ones we might favor in general nowadays. So elliptic curve-based signatures, like Schnorr signatures and the post-quantum-based one. And you might ask for which one of these we know how to sign blindly. And something really strange happens here, which is that actually we kind of know how to do that very easily for RSA signatures and uh, these more powerful BLS signatures. That's part of the flexibility that they have. But basically for those we would like to use in practice, I'm putting here question marks because things are rather complicated. We either don't know how to sign blindly efficiently, or uh, we kind of have some ideas, but they're not yet the, the final result we would like to have. And so it's kind of a strange situation that the kind of signatures we would like to use, we don't know how to sign blindly. And this has led to some paradoxical situation that in the industry is trying to move away from RSA everywhere else, all of these systems I've been described are stuck with using RSA and keeping RSA around just because it's the only way we know how to sign blindly. And in the blockchain space, people will use something like BLS because they can afford doing that, but um, that's not, again, something you will use in the type of systems I described before. So I want to tell you a little bit about this problem. I mean, it's challenging, and I'll, I'll try to go through the challenge here to explain this to a non-crypto audience, but I want to kind of give you a feeling why this problem is exciting and is technically complex, because literally cryptographers have spent decades working on it, tried to come up with good solutions, Many important proof techniques that cryptographers use to prove security have come up in trying to solve this problem. There have been well-known papers that ended up being incorrect. It's a really hard question, and I want to tell you a little bit about, well, about it while knowing that this is a very technical question. And I actually suggest that we might take here a, sort of a five-minute break or something. I don't know if Deerish is okay, and then I can talk a little bit more about the technical. Okay. I can answer a question, yeah, so that's a good, you know, yeah. Uh, well, yes. So I guess the question is whether you're thinking about whether there's a setup involved or not. So typically for this type of solutions, we don't really have, uh, we don't really want to have complicated setups, but we might have something that we call a transparent setup, for example, like something like that you can generate yourself with the hash functions. Or, yeah. Like the and a random oracle is fine. Yeah. 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 So I'll try to convince you the problem is hard enough even given that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question at the back. Oh, yeah, so, so, so I guess you're still thinking in particular about the ad application, for example. Yeah, so, I, so here, I guess what I'm imagining people would like to do, right, is that you are still decoupling the process of generating the signature, which is meant to be blind, with the process of attesting that the event has really happened. So what, I, what you will do is there will be an initial process that will actually try to confirm that that's a real legitimate event and not a, a robot or a spammer. So you will still need to do something, right? Some of these services might try to like attest that you have a mouse and you're really moving it or these kind of things. And then only when that has been confirmed, you will en engage in the blind signature process to generate the blind signature. So that first part of attesting whether the user is really a human and it's not a, a fraud attempt, that will still not be private in, in this context. So I don't know if that kind of answers the question. It's a good question how to do that privately, and at a theoretical level, we could do it, but it would be very costly. And so that, that's definitely a very good uh, question. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So, 
Um, but not in the sense that we would like to, to have them here, yeah. It's a great question, but uh, yeah, no, we, we cannot have them. So basically, you, you can show that the functionality of a signature scheme implies a, a one-way function, which is a computationally hard function to invert, and so it's something we cannot get unconditionally. Um, so, I mean, unless you prove something like, you know, you could... Sorry? I mean, it depends what you consider a theoretical difficulty, but basically for cryptography, nothing we are doing will, will exist if one-way functions do not exist. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I mean, so there are some questions, like, for example, can you get this from, um, you know, the f if you assume that P is an equal NP, are you able to get a one-way function? And that's something that, yeah, we, we don't know how to do, yeah. Yeah, so all of these assumptions that involved here could, could break, for what we know. I mean, that's, unfortunately, that's true for... Yeah, or maybe exactly. Maybe they're not as hard as we want it to be, but there's still some hardness that we could leverage. Yeah. Like yeah, we can resume, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Okay, so what, what I want to do now is that finally I want to kind of go down to the lower level and try to tell you how some of the signatures look like and why, what the technical problems look like. Um, and, I mean, to do that I have to tell you, so this is a bit of a challenge. Uh, I thought about how to present this. I, I need to tell you about the, what these elliptic curves are. And, uh, of course, you might imagine from the name that this is something to do with geometry, and it definitely does. But uh, I also invite you to completely ignore that fact um, and think about this at a much more abstract level. And um, so what you should think about here of an elliptic curve being is that it's, it's just an algebraic structure that involves a set. And yes, we do happen to call the elements of that set points because of this geometric connection, but think of them as elements of that set. And we have a certain finite number of them in that set, call it P. And think of P in general as being a prime and being large for a cryptographic application, say of so it's order 2 to the 256. That's uh, the type of size we're thinking of. And then this, this set comes with an operation that if you had some algebra, so we call it addition, but satisfies the law of a group. If you haven't had any algebra, you don't know what it is, I'll, I'll explain it now. So in particular, this, this operation, this addition operation, which is not a real addition, it's just called an addition, um, is meant to take any two points in the elliptic curve and the addition will give you another point in the elliptic curve. And this operation happens to be commutative, so x plus y is the same as y plus x. And there is also another designated element that acts as a zero for, um, for, for addition, which happens to be called infinity and not zero, again, for some connection with geometry here, and this corresponds to the point at infinity. But again, it doesn't matter. What matters is that if you add infinity to any x, you get x itself. And then, finally, we also have an inverse for any x. So for every x, there's a minus x, which is another point on the curve that if you add the two together, uh, is going to give you infinity. And this operation also happens to be associative, so you can kind of ignore parentheses, essentially, when adding. And this is all I want you to know, as a matter of fact, about what these elliptic curves do. So the, the key point is that you can, even though these elliptic curves are very large algebraic structures, we can represent these points efficiently and we can compute efficiently with them. And um, also in terms of notation, I mean, the nice thing about this elliptic curve notation is you can write some things that look very natural and are exactly what you think they are. For example, I, I write things like k times x for an integer k and a point x that just means adding the point x with itself k times. And then zero times x is defined as, as, as infinity. And in fact, we, maybe a final thing I, I want you to know is that we actually care about elliptic curves that have a specific structure that makes them what we call cyclic. So a cyclic curve has a, a designated element. In fact, if the, if the number of points is prime, and any element will do which is not infinity. And there is some element which we call a generator that allows us to write any element in the curve, any point x, big X, as small x times g. So you can reach any point in the curve by multiplying this generator 
with some uh, number x. And this number is going to be a number between 0 and p minus 1. So we often use this notation zp for the set of numbers between 0 and p minus 1. And these numbers is often called the discrete logarithm of big X, which with these notation in elliptic curves is kind of a very strange name because it's clearly not a logarithm. It's kind of a factor. But the naming comes from, from, from older times where the, the groups we were using to do cryptography were actually having exponentiations and not uh, multiplications. But that's where the name comes from. And so something I want to point out is that if you have a generator, you have a little x, it's very easy to efficiently multiply the generator with x, little x and get big x. But what's hard in general is the inverse question, which is what we call the discrete log problem. So if I give you a point on the curve, big x, and I ask you, can you find little, the discrete log of that point with respect to g? This is something that in general we cannot do efficiently, even on average, not just in the worst case. So if I pick a random point on the curve and ask you, find the discrete log, that's something that um, if you pick the curve correctly, in fact, I think it works on most curves, then the problem is going to be hard. And uh, what I mean by hard is that, um, of course, we cannot prove that, coming back to the question, something we assume to be true. <laughs> but uh, in general, for most curves, the best strategy to compute the discrete logarithm takes time square root p, where p is the number of points. So that would be something of the order 2 to the 128 if we fix p to be 2 to the 256. Right, that's a very large time. And so now the task is, given that we have an elliptic curve for which the discrete log problem is hard, can we come up with a signature? That will answer um, a little bit uh, an open question from before. And so the, the most natural way of doing this that I know of are Schnorr signatures. And it's kind of a sad story when you think about the practical side of crypto that Schnorr signatures haven't been widely used until very recently. Because they were designed by Klaus Schnorr, a very well-known German cryptographer. But he made a, a very bad mistake when he designed this. He decided to, to get a patent for them. And this is something you're not supposed to do in cryptography, because nobody wants to use your thing and, 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 uh, and, and, and pay you for the patent. So I mentioned before other alternative schemes based on elliptic curves. One of them is ECDSA. And I, nothing, I hope nobody finds this insulting involved in crypto, but it's a terrible solution to the problem that was designed only to bypass the patent. Right? So that's the kind of thing that cryptographers have to deal with. Which, um, but Schnorr signatures are extremely elegant. So the idea is that the secret key is just a number mod p, and the uh, public key is just g times the secret key, so the public verification key. So the secret key is the discrete logarithm of the verification key. And then a signature for a message on that, uh, for that key pair consists just of a pair of things. One is a point on the elliptic curve. The other one is a number mod p. By the way, every time, I'll try to stick to the convention that numbers are lowercase and points are uppercase, and numbers are always mod p. I will not put always the mod p there. So every operation is modulo p. And so a signature of this form is valid if basically these two constraints are satisfied. Um, if you compute r plus c times the verification key, you get z times g. And what is c? c is some number that you obtain by using some hash function applied to the message and the point R. So you kind of concatenate some representation of the message and the point R, you hash them, you get a C, and then you verify that that first equality is satisfied, right? which is an equality about uh, points uh, in the elliptic curve. If you, have that, if you have that, it's a valid signature. Now, this shows that you can always verify such a signature by just verifying that these two equalities are satisfied. This can be done efficiently. And to generate a signature, you can do that if you have the signing key. So what you will do is you will generate such a big R knowing its discrete logarithm. So you pick a small R, a random. You multiply G with it. You get big R, then you hash, get C, and then compute little z as R plus the secret key times C. And um, you can realize that this satisfies these two constraints above. And you can do it because you know the signing key. And now you can think whether you could do this if you don't know the signing key. And it turns out that you cannot. That seems intuitive. And in fact, we can prove that the scheme is secure in the sense of unforgeability if the discrete logarithm problem is hard. And, and someone has asked this question. Uh, if you're cryptographers, you're familiar with that. Otherwise, it might sound a little bit strange. Uh, you make a very strong assumption on the hash function. That is what we call a random oracle. So you, you assume that the hash function is ideal and is, behaves as a perfect random function. We know that such random oracles are not it cannot exist. Uh, real hash functions are not random oracles, but it's a common heuristic to validate the security of practical schemes that we will live with here. 
So this is what Schrar signatures are. So there's, there's nothing simpler if you want to get signatures from, um, from elliptic curves. And so the question here is, can we actually find efficient ways to sign blindly with, with Schnorr signatures? And you know, people, of course, have tried doing this. I mean, Schnorr himself uh, wrote a paper about this. And the idea here is that rather than using this generic machinery I, I used before for the generic solution, we are going to leverage the algebra to blind the signing process. And so what we are going to do first is we're going to realize once again that this process of signing can actually be thought as an interactive protocol between a signer and a user. So the signer will first generate a random R. By the way, this little notation with an arrow and a dollar sign means that we are picking this little R at random from the set of numbers from 0 to P minus 1. And then you send R, big R, which is small r times G, to the user. The user will compute the hash, this value C, which we often call the challenge, and then send back the value Z to the user. So it sends back C to the signer, and the signer will respond with Z, and then uh, the user has a signature. Right? There's nothing magical happening here. We just like, split the process of signing between the user and the signer. But now the neat thing that you can do is that you can modify this protocol entirely on the user side to make it blind. And what happens here, I don't want you to verify the math. I think just the idea is sort of natural. What you do is the user will take the R which has been sent by the signer and randomize it, so what cleverly randomize it. So they will compute an R prime, which is obtained by uh, taking R and adding some two extra elliptic curve points that are obtained by multiplying the public key and the generator with two random numbers. So it turns out that R prime is going to be statistically completely unrelated to R. And then uh, we use this R as if we were, si R prime as if we were signing instead of R. So we now hash the message in our prime, get a C prime. But instead of sending C prime back, we send C, which is obtained by adding delta, one of these two random values, back to C. We get the response from the uh, signer. And at the end, we realize that if we take our prime and then this response and add gamma, which is the other random value we use to create our prime, we got ourselves a valid Schnorr signature. But by magic, the Schnorr signature is statistically independent from the interaction between the signer and the user. Okay. And this is as not, no zero knowledge proves nothing, it's just algebra. So we've been just adding um, elements, random elements here and there. And so this is what we call being perfectly blind because it's absolutely statistically independent. But the question now is, great, uh, we now know how to blind Schnorr signing, but is it actually still secure as an unforgeable signature scheme? And you might think, of course it is, because Schnorr signatures are unforgeable, so what does it matter if we do this in an interactive way? Turns out the answer is not that obvious, and I want to clarify also what it means a bit more what to be unforgeable here. And one thing that really, uh, really happens here is that if you think about running this in the real world, um, we really want to have security against malicious users that try to interrupt concurrently through many signing sessions with a signer. I mean, if you think about the tokens application, it's not going to happen that the website will issue tokens sequentially one at a time. They will take multiple connections from multiple users concurrently and deal with them. And so in this particular context, you can imagine that an adversary uh, is a malicious user. They might start a number of sessions concurrently, start them all at the same time, then maybe go ahead and conclude some of them adaptively. And then at the end, what the adversary will try to do, they will try to output some valid signatures for, va for messages. And the adversary will actually succeed in breaking the scheme, in breaking its unforgeability, if they end up producing valid message signature pairs. So they're all valid. They're all distinct. And their number exceeds the number of completed signing sessions. Like, so in this case, the adversary hasn't completed all three sessions. It will be actually a successful break if the adversary comes up with three valid message signature pairs. Right? So this is the, 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 the attacks we have in mind. And it turns out that if you ask the question now, are blind Schnorr signatures secure? Um, it turns out that the answer is actually a resounding no. And this was a kind of a surprising um, kind of shocker among cryptographers because the scheme had been around for um, two decades. Uh, and when in 2021, some, some of my colleagues published a very neat 
very short paper that gave, gives a very simple attack that completely breaks the, this protocol. And if you're not a cryptographer, you should know that this kind of things doesn't happen usually. It's true, as it was said before, that we fear this assumption being broken, but it's very uncommon that someone comes up with a very simple linear time attack, in fact, that completely breaks the scheme. And uh, we knew that there were some weaknesses, and I mean, unsurprisingly, this, this paper received the best paper award. And, um, and, and again, um, that, that kind of led us to, rec lead us to reconsider uh, the entire problem. By the way, many of these folks were at Google at that point. I imagine that at a point, Google was trying to deploy this, and they sort of figure out on the way that that, that wasn't secure. I mean, not everything is lost. I want to point out that there are some partial results about Schnorr signatures. Uh, one of them is that if you bound the level of concurrency or the number of sessions, you can prove them secure. Um, another thing is that there are some heavier protocols that relies on stronger assumption and have some more serious practicality constraints that can generate Schnorr signatures, but for different reasons, we don't want to use them. And then there's a lot of more works and that try to basically go a little bit outside the box and think about different types of signatures that are similar enough to Schnorr signatures and try to give secure protocols for that. And that's where we've been doing a lot of work recently. So I'll try to give you some ideas about why Schnorr signatures are insecure, because it's algorithmically neat, and then spend just a couple of maybe minutes about telling you how we fix that. So, so what's the idea behind these attacks? It's going to be nice because it has nothing to do with crypto. But I have to first tell you why it has nothing to do with crypto. And so these attacks are actually more easily um, cast in a, in a simpler concurrency setting where the sessions are actually run in parallel. So the adversary opens L sessions at the same time, so gets the R values first, L of them simultaneously, then responds to, with some maliciously chosen, potentially maliciously chosen L challenges, these uh, values that are supposed to be the hashes, but they don't need to be and then receives the Z values back all together. And now these are L parallel sessions and the question is can the attacker actually come up with L plus one valid signatures? So one more than they're supposed to. Of course, they can do that if they break the assumption, but I want to show you that we can do this much more efficiently with, with simple, uh, more simple tools. And so the idea here is that this algebra we are exploiting also for blending also gives us a lot of structure that, uh, that we could use for attacks. And one thing that you can do if you, for example, run two parallel sessions, you can start trying to combine this, for example, linearly. So say we got R1, Z1, R2, Z2, and the corresponding C1, C2. What you could do is you could try to take coefficients lambda 1 and lambda 2. And then say you combine the Z1 and Z2 values. And what you notice is that what you get is the right format, kind of. It's going to be the linear combination of the R values plus the secret key times the linear combination of the challenges. It's like everything combines linearly nicely. And if it happens that this uh, combination of the challenges is actually a valid output of a hash, then you got yourself a new signature, right? So what I mean by that is the combination of the R values and of the Z values is going to be a valid signature. So if it also happens that the hash of the message and the combination of the R values equals the combination of the challenges, because that's what the Schnorr signature needs to satisfy. Okay? So now this doesn't necessarily give an attack. Uh, but it's just some structure we want to exploit. And you can actually generalize it if you have multiple sessions. Like you could try to now combine this. So I'm using here an inner product notation. So you can come up with some vectors lambda that you can use to combine the R values, the Z, uh, C values, and the Z values by taking inner product with the same vector lambda. And then the combination of the R's and the Z with respect to that lambda is going to be a valid signature if it happens to be the case that the hash of a message and the combination of the R's equal the combination of the C values for that lambda. So again, I'm running these parallel sessions and I try to come up with a new signature by combining things of C. And if we want to turn this into an attack, um, we, can, we have to add some temporal dimension to this so because things need to be done in the right order. So what the attacker can try to do, he starts this session, get the R values, and then the attacker tries to come up with some vector of challenges C along with K message messages and corresponding lambda vectors such that all of them satisfy this hash constraint. Right? So for each one of them, the hash of the message and the corresponding combination of the R's is equal to the same linear combinations of the C of the challenges, right? So the adversary needs to find a C 
and then k lambda vectors with corresponding messages. And if they succeed in doing that, they just send the corresponding vector c back, get the z values, and now use the lambdas to combine these values together and produce k signatures. Okay, that's the framework. Now, all of this work is kind of useless if we can only do so for a k which is smaller than l, the number of parallel sessions. Why? Because you could do this easily. Just set these lambdas to be the unit vectors, and all you've done is you just generated uh, k valid signatures. That, that's all you've been doing here. There's nothing special. But the question is, can we actually find uh, a way to do this for k which is larger than l? And that would be an actual break of unforgeability. And this actually corresponds to an abstract problem, which has nothing to do with crypto. And uh, uh, basically, the idea here is that we think of a game. This problem is called ROS. I won't spell it out what it stands for. It's a terrible acronym for a mouthful. It sounds good as an acronym, but what it means is pretty much a mouthful. And you imagine that this is a game involving an adversary that can query an oracle. And these oracle queries define linear constraints, where the adversary chooses the, kind of the linear function part with some vector lambda i for, each I, for the i query. And uh, it's an L-dimensional vector. And then what is returned is some random inhomogeneity for this linear constraint, uh, delta i, which is chosen uniformly at random upon each query. You can query the same lambda multiple times if you wish so. Every time, you're going to get a different delta i. Then after some number of queries, what is going to happen is that the adversary will try to output a solution c. And then we check how many of the constraints defined by these queries or the linear constraint are actually satisfied. So for each one of the queries we made, we check whether lambda i product c equals delta i. And the question is, can we actually solve more than L constraint? Can we solve at least L plus 1 constraint? And the reason it's hard intuitively is because you're choosing the linear constraint, but you're getting a random delta i outside. And you're asking to solve an overdetermined system of linear equations where the inhomogeneous part is chosen uniformly at random. So that in very likely you're supposed to get something which is not solvable. And so it seems hard to actually find a set of constraints that are solvable. But the point here is that if you, this captures exactly what is going on without cryptography. So if you can actually efficiently win this game, you have an attack against unforgeability. And the question is how hard is it to win this game? And people had realized uh, uh, this is the algorithmic part I would like to have time to discuss, but I won't really do more than telling you the results. But people had realized pretty early that there is a sub-exponential attack against this problem. So it's better than we would like it to be in terms of harness. But that was what was considered to be the best attack against this for, for many years until in uh, 2021, this work I just mentioned came up with essentially a linear time solution for this, which is rather unusual and impressive. I really don't have the time to explain it, but it's actually extremely simple. I invite you to look at the paper. Basically, the introduction, the first two pages explain the whole paper. It's, it's, very, it's very simple and surprising. It only works if L is sufficiently large. It's more than log P. That will be around 256 sessions in practice, but that's hardly a, a constraint uh, in real-world system. And so very briefly, five minutes, I want to tell you what we actually did. So this was really meant to be a general lecture. So the question is, how, how can we bypass um, so this? And what we really wanted to do is we wanted to change the scheme minimally that I just presented and get something which is actually um, secure. And I will, the price that we pay here is that we get something which is very similar to a Schnorr signature. It's very easy to modify code for Schnorr signatures to get what we have, but it's not quite a Schnorr signature. It's just slightly longer, and, but similar flavor. So basically here, the, the idea we consider is we started from the protocol I just described, so interactive Schnorr signing. And then we just modified a little bit. And the idea is that initially, instead of just sending the, the value big R, what we do is we actually choose some extra random value, y and w, and we send an extra elliptic curve point, y, big Y, which is basically a linear combination of the generator G and some other generator H that needs to be defined as part of the scheme. And this is, the idea is that cryptographically this also acts as an algebraic commitment. So once the adversary has sent this y over, this y doesn't give any information about w and y, the little values. But uh, the adversary is only, if the adversary is later asked to explain which values little w and little y that's used, there's only one way to open this commitment. Okay. 
but at the beginning it looks like it's just a random point on the curve, then things will proceed as before, except that now you hash the message and the sum of R and Y, and then you get something similar back, but now this value um, doesn't have, yeah, my pointer works. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just point to it. So you, instead of having C times the secret key as before, this Y value we had committed to before is going to be also multiplied with C. We sort of randomize the C, and then we need to send both Y and W along to, to sort of verify that this is a valid opening of this initial value, big Y. And then the final signature is just one kind of number mod P longer than Schnorr signatures. You will obtain it by adding R and Y, Z plus W, little W, and then you need to add small Y. And I won't go through it for the interest of time, but you can now write down very simple equations that are just slightly less efficient to check than with Schnorr signatures to verify that the signature is valid. And it turns out that this scheme, um, I, I, I'll skip this in the interest of time as well, but there is some variant of the problem, that of the ROS problem, which we call WFROS. I, I won't go through this, but it's a similar spirit. There's an oracle, there's some constraints that you need to satisfy, and end up actually capturing exactly what goes on. But different from the ROS problem, so here we can actually prove that this problem is unconditionally hard. So this doesn't involve any assumption, so we, we can actually prove that this variant of the problem that really captures the core of the security argument behind our scheme. Um, the only way to win in this case is by making a number of queries to the oracles that allows us to define constraint, which is of the order square root of p, where p, again, is a huge number. It's meant to be exponentially large. So it's really an unconditionally exponentially hard problem, and then that can be combined with obtaining our final theorem that actually shows that the scheme is secure, assuming the harness of the discrete log problem, and then uh, again, random oracles as before. Although that, I just like wrapping up, I might go maybe two minutes over time, is that a problem? Or, okay, yeah. So just wrapping up, I wanna say, talk about a little bit open problems and ongoing work, and the first one actually come from this uh, theorem already. And, and, and it's actually the fact that I, I cheated a little bit, and there's something very technical for non-cryptographers, but that a lot of these results around blind signatures, in fact, all of them, up to very recently, they don't actually prove the theorem I stated here, but they prove a sort of weaker version of it, which restricts the class of adversaries for which we can prove security. And they rely on something which cryptographers call the algebraic group model, which basically restricts adversaries to be nicely behaved in a way I don't have time to define here. And then a big open question has been whether you can remove this algebraic group model, and, and, and this is something we have been making some progress recently, so I have some work in submission with my students that give schemes that are more expensive than what I've explained here, definitely, but actually drop for the first time this requirement of the algebraic group model. It's not clear it matters at all in practice because uh, the, um, it doesn't mean, the fact that you're using it in your proof doesn't mean that the scheme is insecure in any way, but it would be better if you can give a proof without having any restrictions on the adversaries for which you prove security. Uh, yes, and assuming, we assume computational diffie Hellman, but yeah. So really, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would like to talk about this, but it would be maybe much less uh, suitable for, for this talk. Um, so another thing I wanted to point out, that from the practicality side, uh, I learned a few lessons. Maybe something that wasn't clear, I'm, I'm also a theoretician by trade, so I learn things about the real world when doing these kind of things. I mean, the first surprising thing is that the scheme I just presented is extremely practical. So this is a, you don't have to read all of the numbers, but the bottom line is if you compare it with the other things we can do, RSA, blind signing, and BLS, it's extremely competitive and in some cases beats them. So this is in terms of signing performance, in terms of verification of signatures, and also signature size and key size. And so you, the question here is like, well, are we done? Have we, have we found something amazing that we can use in the real world? And it turns out that, uh, again, things are very complicated when you want to deploy things in practice. And there is one thing that our scheme is giving up on. And the fact is that if you look at even the generic construction or if you look at RSA blind signatures, they have a very nice property, which is that they are round optimal, meaning they only require one single round trip um, to generate a blind signature with the server. In contrast here, we have this three message flow that we need to go through. And if you want to implement that, it actually requires keeping some state on the side of the, of the, of the signer. 
which usually it's harder to implement and also opens the door to denial of service attacks in practice because you could try to open a bunch of sessions and waste the memory on the, on the signer side and, and that's not great. There are contexts where this is fine. Microsoft has a system for anonymous credentials that relies on such protocols. It's called UProof and is being announced to use some of the ideas from this protocol right now. And they are fine because they don't have something facing the internet and having massive, massive numbers of connections, but in general, you would like to have something which is ground optimal. And this is actually one of the big open questions. It's like whether we can actually come up with something that only requires one round trip. And unfortunately, I conjecture that the answer here is, is a negative one, but I was never able to prove an impossibility result that basically tells us that all you can do if you want to have something round optimal that doesn't involve RSA or stronger types of elliptic curves is the generic construction I described at the beginning. If that's true, we will have to think around uh, this also from a practical perspective. Maybe we are stuck with, uh, with RSA. Um, the other thing I wanted to say just one minute is about post-quantum, because everyone in cryptography is now talking about post-quantum secure systems, and we're standardizing them. So what's the deal with that and blind signatures? And here, if you ask people working in this space, they might be more optimistic than I am, but it, it turns out that I consider this largely open at this point, at least with respect to things that work well in practice. So there was some older work that tried to build analogs of Schnorr signatures in the, from lattices in the, the dark post-quantum secure. They actually can only prove limited types of security, and it's, these are very technical results. There were errors and papers fixing them and so on. And lately, there's been a few papers um, that have tried to instantiate this generic construction from lattices. They try to build all of their components as best as they can. And they, they get something which can be run uh, in some reasonable running time. But just to give you a sense, for example, the size of the signatures you produce is still something like for 45 kilobytes, which is basically about 500 times bigger than what we have from elliptic curves. The running time maybe is not as bad, but again, this is the type of orders of magnitude you have to compare. So there's really a huge gap, and people have tried other problems, there's something called isogenous, which has been considered in the post-quantum setting. Everything has been broken uh, in that context so far. There was a recent result this summer at one of our conferences, and there were two attacks breaking it a couple of weeks ago. So this is the state of affairs, it's very, it's very open here, and, and it's a good uh, source of problems. So just to conclude, I hope I convince you that um, there's something very interesting here happening, both on the practical side. So there are systems that are being considered. These are systems that are not, should not be thought as giving you the strongest possible guarantees that you could get with stronger theoretical machinery that exists in cryptography, but they are scalable, they're usable, they're being tested. Uh, as we speak, and the underlying cryptographic primitives are interesting on their own right. I think coming back to some of the questions before, there's a lot of work that needs to be done here uh, from people who are not necessarily cryptographers on understanding both potential attacks against these systems, the way the metadata is used, try to see which information you get out of this, and there's also a policy type of uh, work that should be done. Because again, when you decide how much information should be leaked or not, it's up to you to decide what the policies are. And it will be interesting to see what's the connection with different uh, regulatory uh, settings uh, with respect to these solutions. Um, on the technical side, there's, there's a bunch of questions, some of which I talked about. Um, I think there is also a lot of interesting questions in the space of tokens, uh, like things that are sort of between blind signatures and anonymous credentials and give more expression that both things you can do, but maybe more efficient than anonymous credential. And so everything I've been talking about today can be found on my webpage. So all of the papers are online, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you for listening. And... More questions? Oh, yeah, jump. Uh, it's a great question, uh, and maybe we shouldn't not want to use it, but so, so again, these are the interesting things I, I learned over time because, you know, you are theoreticians, you come, you talk to practitioners, you say, why aren't you using BLS, right? And, and um, there, there, there is really sort of a, a you know, when you, when you want to use crypto in the real world, there, there, there's really different levels of trust that people have in different types of cryptography. 
And if you, for example, want to implement something on a browser that for many of these applications I mentioned, that's the point, so the browser will need to run some of this crypto, you end up having to rely on libraries that um, need to be really tested very carefully. I mean, there's a lot of attack surface on, on browsers. And people just don't seem to feel confident that pairings are at a point, so pairing-friendly curves, to be available in those libraries. Now, is that a good thing or not? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, presumably, we couldn't steer things in a direction that will make this type of elliptic curves more widely available. It just didn't happen. Right? So if you talk to, and you have other issues, like, for example, I mentioned this system by Microsoft Uproof that doesn't use pairings. They could, they could make it even more efficient, but they want to engage with government uh, customers that need to use certain types of cryptography that is standardized by NIST, and there's no pairings coming from NIST, right? So there's all sort of interesting constraints that for us as theoretical cryptographers as well, no pairings is a weaker assumption than with pairings, so I go in that direction, but they end up mattering in practice because there's much more assurance behind pairing-free curves than pairing-friendly curves. But if you're running a blockchain, and there are plenty of applications there for blind signatures I haven't talked about, you're doing things with pairings already, so just go ahead and use BLS and everything will be, will be simpler. Yeah. Uh, 